Today's message is Tower of Babel. Everybody say Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. This is a pretty prominent story in the Genesis account. I imagine when you were younger and you were a child, you heard the story of the Tower of Babel, right? And we talk about it because we go, wow, they're building such a big tower that God said, oh yeah, they're going to accomplish what they want to accomplish and they're going to make it into heaven. This is the key to this story. They're going to make it into heaven because they want to overthrow God, right? God says they're going to be capable, so let's go and confuse their language. In fact, let's read that real quick so that we know what the scriptures say. Genesis chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing which they propose to do will be impossible for them. Now, I want you to understand something about this passage. This is really important. When they say that they, they want to build a tower that reaches to heaven, uh, all, the, all that we have in Hebrew is tower top heaven. Okay, And the truth is that word for heaven there is also utilized elsewhere in scripture for the gates of heaven and the God of heaven. So although it can mean just the atmosphere, it actually does frequently in scripture mean the heaven where we will dwell with God, where God dwells, that heaven. And so they wanted to build a tower to heaven. And God says something very specific. He says that this thing that they're intending to do is not impossible. Now, with the worldly cosmology that we've been given, it is impossible. You would build a tower up to the stratosphere as the oxygen thinned out. You would then suffocate in space and die and you would never make it into heaven. Right. That cosmology teaches that heaven is not directly above however many hundreds of thousands of feet up does not teach that. And yet the Bible teaches that there is the ability to build a tower, at least at this time. You might say, well, there's not enough oxygen up there, so no matter what, they would have suffocated. I would challenge that with the fact that if you look at uh, the redwoods in California and, and, and some of the history of the size of things on Earth, uh, in the Genesis account, we're dealing with giants. We're dealing with much larger objects. And I actually believe that the Earth was much more like a greenhouse with a lot more oxygen at the time than we're experiencing presently. So there were some different, some climate differences in Genesis at this time, uh, this close to the flood was, uh, was very close to Eden, in fact. It's not that far away from Eden. So um, with that, I want you guys to uh, really consider what we're talking about today. We are going to be talking about biblical cosmology versus the worldly cosmology. And the truth is, biblical cosmology and worldly cosmology are not the same. They do not play nice. They do not get along, as you'll see in scripture. And stories like this really appeal to the biblical cosmology being true and the worldly cosmology that you hear from NASA not being true. Now, before diving into this, a lot of people give this a uh, frustrated answer to the topic of cosmology. And they say, well, it's either not uh, related to salvation or it's not important. And I'd like to challenge those two ideas. First off, not related to salvation doesn't make sense because in Romans chapter one, verse 20, Paul makes the case that creation points us to God. And in fact, to even know that Christ is the Lord, you need to believe that there is a God. And so Paul makes the argument that creation points us to the fact that there is a creator. So creation matters. Secondly, Genesis chapter one is the cosmology of the earth. And Genesis chapter one is where God decided to start the narrative of the Bible. And you are introduced to concepts like the firmament and the sun being made before earth in Genesis chapter one before you're ever introduced to the Messiah in Genesis chapter three. So we have creation and then we have the fall of man and Satan and then we have the Messiah and redemption. That is the narrative in those first three chapters. So the first thing you are presented with is creation. 
And the devil knows this. This is why he invests so much time, money, energy, and effort into worldly cosmology to get you to believe that there is no God and that there's just nothingness and we exploded from nothingness. So Satan has every reason to be deceiving people. So it does relate to salvation in that creation points us to God. When we get to know God, we know that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world who died on the cross and resurrected three days later. And you, you need to understand that that's why there's such resistance to this. And then to the statement that it's not important, this isn't an important topic, uh, I again would contend that Genesis 1 and Romans 1 and so much of Scripture talks about creation that that's not biblically based reality. It, 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 we, we have to realize that Scripture talks about creation so frequently that we must talk about it as well. And there's nothing unimportant in the Scriptures. So I would challenge that statement with that rebuttal. There is nothing unimportant in the Scriptures. Every word is breathed by God, according to Scripture. And that means that all of it matters. In fact, the Scriptures say all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. So it's very important to understand that. Those of you joining us online, so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming and wrestling with this topic together with us. We want to understand the truth about cosmology, and we want to be brave as we dive into the scriptures and believe God's word over everything else. So I applaud you for being here. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, comment below anything you learn or any questions that you have. We really appreciate you being here. And I also encourage you to listen to the entire sermon, because if you don't, you're probably going to ask questions that are going to be answered within the length of the sermon. Now, if the sermon's a little bit long for you and you look at that time code and you're going, wow, that's just a little long for me, try listening to it in segments and taking it in in phases. That way you can actually get the whole topic and the whole argument. And then after that, please start commenting and sharing your questions and what have you. Be happy to address them and talk to you about them. But I hope to address some of them today. I'd like to open with an opening written statement since this is such an important topic. So I'm going to be reading that to you. Thank you for being here with us. <clears throat> Before discrediting biblical cosmology, consider the following. As Christians, we believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. As a result, we believe people like Adam and Methuselah lived nearly a millennium in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, and Genesis 5, verse 27. Fallen angels procreated with human women and produced a race of demonic superhuman giants in chapter, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. A catastrophic flood subsequently engulfed the earth in Genesis chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. And ancient Babylonians built a tower nearly reaching heaven itself in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, which is our primary discussion today. Contrary to modern claims that Genesis is a poetic rendering of fables, the Messiah Jesus, the Apostle Peter, and Jude affirmed the stories as valid historical events. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, and Jude chapter 1, verses 4 through 16. Moses also testified that he wrote down everything the Lord had said in Exodus chapter 24, verse 4, and it's Moses who wrote Genesis. And again, Jesus confirms this is true in John chapter 5, verse 46. In light of these supernatural beliefs and many more, Christ's healings and resurrection, resurrection of the believers, millennial kingdom, and the new heaven and new earth, among, among many other uh, amazing beliefs that we have, is believing we live on a stationary, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30, circular, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, and Job chapter 38, verses 13 and 14. Landmass covered by a molten glass, according to Job chapter 37, verse 18. Dome, according to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. Known as the firmament in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Really that big of a stretch. I'm going to ask that question again without the scriptures. Is believing, in, in light of all these other beliefs we hold, is believing we live on a stationary circular landmass covered by a molten glass dome known as the firmament really that big of a stretch? God made us a terrarium and its existence points us to his existence according to Romans chapter 1 verse 20. 
In fact, the Bible presents us with the firmament in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, before it introduces us to the promised Messiah in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I believe God knows what he's doing when he wrote that narrative. If we believe the Bible, we believe the earth was created before the sun in Genesis chapter 1, verse 10. The sun was set inside the firmament and not 93 million miles away, according to Genesis 1, verses 14 through 18. The sun geocentrically circuits the earth within the firmament, according to Psalm chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. And the sun, not the earth, stood still in Joshua during the war with the Amorites in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. Moreover, observable science testifies to a small, close sun due to the existence of crepuscular rays, which are rays that show that there must be a smaller light source closer to the clouds and not 93 million miles away. In fact, if we had a giant ball of light 93 million miles away, then that means the light at that massive size coming onto the earth would all come through the clouds at the same angle. And yet we get these incredible rays of light at various degrees that show that the sun is smaller and close, just like the Bible says. If there is a firmament with waters above it, what are the stars? Job indicates they are angels singing in Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. Now, before concluding this to be another laughable, archaic, poetic rendering of the cosmos, instead of literal scientific fact, look into sana luminescence. Okay, sano for sound, luminescence for light. Sano luminescence, the emission of light from imploding bubbles in a liquid when excited by sound. That's what sano luminescence is. It's also popularly named star in a jar. In other words, sound produces light in water under the right conditions. And certainly angels know what those right conditions are. And that actually testifies to the fact that the stars are light being produced by angels singing above the firmament in the waters above. As the scriptures say in Genesis 1, there are waters above the firmament. There's many other flat earth evidences witnessed by genuine scientific experiments. Now, genuine scientific experiments are observable, testable, repeatable, and falsifiable. And that's how you spot scientism. Scientism does not allow itself to be questioned, tested, or falsified. It is a belief system that you must adhere to or else you are a conspiracy theorist or other derogatory term, an idiot, what, what have you. Uh, but the truth is, it must be falsifiable for it to be true science. And we're not being scientific if we're not able to question the narrative that we are being given. There's many other flat earth evidences witnessed by genuine scientific experience, uh, experiments, such as buoyancy, density, and mass accounting for everything that we call gravity. The lack of curvature in geological surveys when Earth ought to be curving eight inches per mile squared. That would be m squared times eight. That's the mathematic equation. And yet geological surveys do not show any curvature, do not even account for it. Mathematically, eight inches per mile squared is a tremendous amount of curvature that should be witnessed in those mathematic equations, and it's not there. Water always finding level. It's very difficult to imagine water sticking to a spinning ball when water, as we know, its very nature is to find level. It creates the horizontal horizon that we see when we're looking at the ocean. Water always finds its level. The unmoving Polaris known as the North Star. Now, some people have a hard time with this, but magnetic north always points to the center of the Earth, and the North Star is always at the center of the Earth. And they say, well, what about the Southern Hemisphere? Well, if you look around, and I know there's a lot of censorship online, but if you look around, there are evidences that you are experiencing perspective shifts when you see the southern hemisphere making its star trail circles and the northern hemisphere making its star trail circles, and you're standing somewhere in between the two. It actually can be recreated with a half glass dome, kind of like a snow globe, on top of a star trail piece of paper, when you look at the perspective, it will create circles on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, representing the hemispheres. However, it's literally done on a flat table with flat circular star trails. So you can actually recreate what you witness. And that actually attests to the fact that the North Star really is truly at the center of that firmament 
which we all can use to navigate on the earth. And then, of course, that magnetism always points to the center of the earth as well. Also, atmospheric lensing, distorting objects at extended distances. Uh, you can look into something called Skiba lensing. This is by Rob Skiba. He was a believer, and he helped to develop a, an understanding, an experiment, where when you have a lens on a flat table and you move a boat down that table, even though it's a flat table, it disappears over the curve because of the lensing. Now, how does the atmosphere lens? Well, water acts as a lens. And so the greater the, le the, the, greater the moisture in the air, the greater the lensing that occurs, and it makes things appear to disappear over the curve. However, on a clear, dry day, again, remembering it's supposed to be eight inches per mile squared, on a clear, dry day, you can, with a Nikon zoom lens and, and a telescope and other uh, high-powered lenses, you can pull things back into view that should be hundreds, sometimes thousands of feet below the curvature of the Earth. And so the science just isn't adding up. Which brings me to my primary question in this topic today, this sermon. Why did God intervene at the Tower of Babel? That's what I want to present with you. Why did he intervene at the Tower of Babel? It really is a nonsensical story for God to intervene and to say, oh, they're going to make it to heaven if the truth is they're building a tower to suffocate and die. Right? So why did God intervene? If wicked men were building a tower into the vacuum of space where they would simply suffocate and die, why confuse their language and halt the project? And this brings up another point. It's not possible for a vacuum and atmosphere to touch each other without the vacuum sucking the atmosphere out in order to try and neutralize the atmosphere. And yet, we're told that our Earth's atmosphere gradually touches the vacuum of space, and somehow that vacuum does not suck out the atmosphere. It doesn't make sense, and it's not even scientific. It really is pseudoscience. You've never witnessed it. It's not possible to recreate that. Remember, science is observable, testable, repeatable, and falsifiable. And the truth is, if you can't even create a, an experiment to recreate the phenomena that you believe exists, it's not scientific, it's pseudoscience. At Babel, Nimrod and mankind as a whole intended to enter heaven itself. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, which we just read. This Hebrew word, samayim, which I want to show you. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. I want to show this to you real quick. This word right here, Samayim, its first definition is heaven, okay? Uh, and by the way, we're using the literal word app. It's free on the App Store for both iPhone and Android. It's amazing. It has multiple translations built in, and then it has the Abbott Smith Hebrew and Greek uh, concordance and lexicon built in. I think you would really benefit from it, so please download it. All right. So this Hebrew word, Samayim, in this verse is the same gate of heaven in Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. And the same God in heaven above in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. In other words, they were building an actual tower to the gate of heaven. That was the idea. God considered their plan to enter heaven through the firmament to be possible and took action in Genesis chapter 11, verses 6 and 7. Man continues this nonsense to this day. We've launched nuclear weapons at the firmament during Operation Fishbowl, which was a project inside of the Umbrella Project, Operation Dominic I in 1962, just to see what would happen, of course. In fact, there's footage of us shooting nukes into the stratosphere going, yeah, we just want to see what nukes do up there. Well, we were firing these nuclear weapons at the firmament to see if we've progressed in technology uh, any further than they did at Babel. It, man has not changed. There are people, I want you to understand this about these two kingdoms. There are people serving Jesus Christ and are deceived. And then there are people who are serving Satan and are not deceived, they literally believe that Satan's going to win, and their duty is to deceive you. In fact, the scriptures say that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light, and that his servants also masquerade as angels of light. Now, I don't want to be too conspiratorial, but I want you to remember that just because someone says they're a Christian doesn't automatically mean that there's a, they're a Christian. There are many people who are part of fraternal organizations across the world, in fact, and especially in the United States where space exploration is centered, and pharma is centered as well, that are part of fraternal organizations that identify as Christians in order to infiltrate and deceive people. And you go, that, that's, that's just too wild for me. You look into the Gospels. 
Jesus had people, it says, who were spying on him, pretending to be sincere so that they could hand him over to the power of the governor. In other words, so that they could uh, get him in trouble. And they were spying and pretending to be sincere. This occurs in the Gospels. It occurs throughout Scripture. It's very real and it occurs today. So don't automatically believe every authority just because they say, hey, I'm a pastor. Let the Bible speak for itself. Now, the book of Jasher in chapter 9, verses 20 through 39, affirms this intent to make war in heaven and sheds light on additional surrounding events. Before discrediting the book, you ought to know that the book of Enoch, which is another book that we think is not canon, the book of Enoch is referenced or quoted in Jude chapter 1, verse 4, verse 6, verse 13, 14, and 15, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 3, verse 13, and John chapter 7, verse 38. Likewise, the book of Jasher is referenced or quoted in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18, and it's literally quoted in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. The biblical canon is its own discussion that we'll table for now, but the point is these are books that the early church certainly read and that we see all the way back in the times of uh, Samuel and Joshua. So these are books that matter. And then, of course, Enoch is believed and Jude is quoting it as though uh, it was written by Enoch himself. Okay? And there are actually some African churches that accept these books and have for a very long time. Now, what are we to do with the Tower of Babel built to enter heaven narrative? Is it a fable or a historical event? As for me and my house, it is a historical fact. All right, let's dive into it. Are you guys ready to dive in? If you are, say amen. Amen. I know that was quite the intro and you can actually rewatch that, uh, you know, if you want to hear those, all those arguments. But that is my opening statement, my opening remarks. And now we're going to dive into and this part isn't scripted. So we're going to dive into the scriptures together uh, and, and get into it and see what occurs. So we read the narrative in Genesis 11. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter one. Ezekiel chapter one. OK. Starting from verse 26. Now. Um, when, you, when you see it here, I'm, I'm reading out of the NASB 1995, uh, you'll see that the rakia uh, is translated here as an expanse uh, in the King James. In fact, let's switch to the King James so you can see. Uh, it's going to translate it as firmament. The reason why it's going to translate it as firmament is because rakia in Hebrew, look at this, it's, it's a solid surface. It's a solid surface. Um, uh, it's a, and when it's translated, it means the vault of heaven supporting, look at this, vault of heaven supporting waters above, considered by Hebrews. Now, I find this interesting. Was Moses a fool? Was God just speaking to man in a way he could understand? That's what I hear sometimes. No, God speaks the truth only, Amen. not in obscurity. He either doesn't say anything, which are called the mysteries of God, or he speaks the truth. He does not obscure facts. He does not manipulate facts. He tells the truth. That's what God does. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Hebrews and prophets specifically, who we seem to think wrote the inerrant word of God, somehow erred on cosmology. And that just doesn't make sense. So considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above. And we're going to read that in Genesis 1 in just a moment. But I wanted you to see this because in the CJB, which is the complete Jewish Bible, okay, and that is, this is how the Jews would translate this passage. It says this, and Eze Jewish Christians, Messianic Christians. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26, above the dome that was over their heads. So King James says firmament, which I'm fine with, but uh, the Jews call it a dome. Above the dome that was over their heads was something like a throne that looked like a sapphire. On it, above it, was what appeared to be a person. I saw what looked like gleaming amber-colored fire radiating from what appeared to be his waist upward. Downward from what appeared to be his waist, I saw what looked like fire giving a brilliant light all around him. This brilliance around him looked like a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. This was how the appearance of the glory of Adonai looked. When I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of someone speaking. 
Ezekiel's understanding, and we're going to see this in Genesis chapter 1, Ezekiel's understanding of how the firmament worked was it was a dome, there's waters above that dome, and then there's literally God's throne, which he's being given the opportunity to see, and God is this bright, shining light surrounded by a glory that looks like a misty rainbow, which is pretty incredible, and he's beholding the glory of Adonai in this vision. And the cosmology matters. Because in NASA's version of cosmology, you're just on that spinning space rock, which is both spinning and then orbiting and then vortexing, three movements. But the scriptures say it's fixed and immovable. It has this rakia, this solid dome over it, and that God literally sits on his throne above that dome. And Ezekiel is being given a vision of Adonai, God, the Father, on that throne above. That is not, not at all what worldly cosmology teaches. And this is what I'm trying to present to you today, that this is not only evident here in Ezekiel 1, it's all throughout the biblical narrative. In fact, let's begin to look at some of these scriptures that we brought up earlier. First off, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. Since we've brought up the firmament, I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. Okay? And it says this, And God said, Let there be a firmament. We're reading out of the King James now so that we have this word firmament so you understand. The writers of the King James wanted the word firm in there because rakia in Hebrew is a solid structure. It's that simple. That's why. So all the modern translations, they just want to say expanse because they want to believe that atmosphere touches a vacuum without a solid structure and somehow it doesn't suck atmosphere out. That's not scientific. We've never recreated that. That's not a, a, a scientific explanation. And yet that's what our Bible's translated as. And the truth is, English translations are heavily influenced by modern cosmology, which is always the NASA version of cosmology. Now, before diving too much into it, literally the word NASA, I, I'm going to show you. We'll come back to Genesis 1. But I, 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 wanna, I want to help you to start to see who NASA is right at the very beginning uh, depending on how long you even end up listening to the sermon. Um, so in Genesis chapter 3, we actually get uh, the word NASA. Here we go. We actually get the word NASA uh, here when Eve says, the serpent beguiled or deceived me and I did eat. That word NASA in Hebrew actually means to deceive, to beguile, to deceive, to beguile. Now, it's no mistake. I mean, the Large Hydron Collider has Shiva uh, images outside of it. Uh, NASA, the Hebrew word means to deceive. Um, you know, the Meta uh, platform, Meta means death. Uh, these people actually are serving Satan, and they utilize symbology and words that indicate to their own inside and in the know that they are serving Satan. And Satan likes to deceive you and tell you that he doesn't exist and no, there's no church of Satan and no, there's nobody serving Satan. But there absolutely is. He's been here in the garden deceiving us since Genesis chapter 3. The serpent deceived me. NASA, deceive. Okay, that's what that Hebrew word means. Now, back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 6. So we can talk a bit more. And again, you go, oh, what's this got to do with Jesus? What's it? Listen, folks, Jesus is introduced in Genesis chapter 3, okay, that Eve would have offspring eventually, this is the first time the Messiah is mentioned, who would crush the serpent's head, okay? That's Jesus. But we're introduced to cosmology. When you read the Bible, starting at chapter 1, you are introduced to the firmament and the way the world works, the way it was created, before you're introduced to Jesus. Why? Well, the scriptures say that Without faith, it is impossible to please God because everyone must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So part of believing that God exists is believing in the cosmology, in the creation that he made. When you know and realize you're living in a domed terrarium that God made and sits above, it's hard to deny that there is a God. You essentially either join Nimrod who wants to make war with God because he does accept that God is there, right? You join up with Satan who wants to make war with God. There's no more question about whether there's a God. He's there. So you either want to make war with God or you want to make peace with God. It's one or the other. That's the biblical narrative. You either join up with Nimrod or you join up with Noah, right? Like you either love the Lord or you want to make war with the Lord. And so part of Satan's deception presently 
is that, well, you're not in a terrarium, right? You're on a spinning space rock uh, with all these unbelievable, if you study the speed of, uh, at which the earth spins and orbits and vortexes, you'll see repeating sixes all throughout the mathematics constantly, 666, 666. I mean, the devil is always making evident to his own where he's working while deceiving the masses. And as Christians and as the church, we ought to not be deceived by the enemy any longer. And the only way that you're not going to be deceived anymore, no longer be nasa by the serpent, you must believe what the word of God says. Well, what does the word of God say about cosmology? It says in Genesis chapter one, verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. That's, that's wild, folks. There, we're being told by God that there is a solid structure. Remember, Rakia and any true Hebrew scholar will tell you this truth, okay? They will not hide from it. They will say something along the lines of, yes, Rakia is believed to be a solid structure, but we believe that God was meeting people where they were in their knowledge and understanding. Well, I don't see why they had to be told a lie by God. That just doesn't align with Scripture. In fact, Isaiah, and we'll look at this today, but Isaiah makes very clear in his writings that the earth is a circle and that God sits above that circle. And before you go, well, he, he didn't have a word for ball. In the same writings earlier in his writings, okay, he actually uses the word sphere or ball when he's talking about another topic not related to cosmology. But when he talks about cosmology in Isaiah 40, he says the earth is a circle. So, there's no denying that Hebrews knew what a ball was and God could have told them the earth was a ball and yet nowhere in scripture does it ever say the earth is a ball. In fact, it says it's a circle and that it has a firmament dividing the waters above from the waters below. Now, I mentioned this during the opening statement, but sauna luminescence is actually really amazing. If you're on YouTube, you can go and look at some of these experiments, but under the right conditions, you can create a star in a jar. You can send sound waves into the water at the right frequency and it will, the implosion that's occurring with the water bubbles will produce light. That's it, sound and water at the right, uh, under the right conditions produces light, produces a star in the water. That is amazing. Well, what does the scripture say? Well, there's a firmament that divided the waters above from the waters below. And this relates to the story of Noah as well. It says that the gates, the doors of the firmament opened and poured water. That was part. And then waters from the great deep came up. That was how the earth flooded, folks. There was additional water from beneath the earth and above the earth that was welcomed into the terrarium. That's how the earth flooded. And because there is a solid uh, dome over the structure, it filled up with water above the highest mountain, right? That's what the scriptures teach in Genesis. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed that we have... Uh, people like Ken Ham, who I really appreciate for supporting the biblical narrative of creation and the flood, who still adhere to worldly NASA deceived me cosmology when everything aligns with the scriptures. There are literally doors in the firmament that open in the scriptures. We can't deny that. And there are floodgates down in the deep. In fact, you can see this scientifically. Submarines have gone down to extreme depths and reached pockets of water that are too dense to enter. The submarine cannot descend into the pocket of water at the deepest depths of the earth. And the Bible says that those exist well before we ever had submarines. Is that wild? So there's plenty of, this is not an unscientific, I always hear that, it's unscientific. This is not unscientific. What's unscientific is that the earth should be curving eight inches per mile squared, and it's not in any survey ever. Line of sight weapons work because there is no curvature, right? Lasers, long distance measurements using lasers do not observe curvature. It's just nonsense, okay? So this is not an unscientific belief. We live under the firmament and it is a solid structure. And what does it do? It divides the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. In other words, there are the heavens. In fact, in scripture, there's multiple heavens. There's the heavens that we would call atmosphere. And then there's the heavens above the firmament, right? The one that the um, 
Babylonians, the ancient Babylonians under Nimrod, were trying to get to. And the, that heaven is the actual glory of God heaven. Hence why Ezekiel says above the dome was the throne and the glory of God. And Adonai was sitting on his throne. Okay, so pretty strong indicator, right? That there's a different cosmology from Genesis chapter one. In fact, if you teach NASA cosmology to little kids and they open the Bible to Genesis one and they hear this, they just go, that's nonsense, right? You tell the teenagers in high school this, and they go, that's just stupid. This is stupid nonsense. This is archaic. This is nonsense. And then Christians who are a little bit kinder to the scriptures, they'll say, well, it's, poet it's a poetic rendering. No, this is literally the cosmology of the earth, right? God is not lying to us. Do not make God out to be a liar. His word is always true. It either is or it isn't. You can't claim that the Bible is the inerrant word of God and then say that it contains errors. It's one or the other, okay? Now, this is also really interesting, but the sun in this narrative was made, okay, um, at a different time than what the scriptures teach. So next we have the earth being made, right? So God creates the earth. And look at this, verse 14. So after God creates the earth, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. In other words, the reason why the moon phases is it's its own light source. I know that's another one that, that we have to relearn. Okay. So two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. So the stars are in the waters above due to sauna luminescence. The sun and the moon are believed to be within the firmament, giving light and seasons. How does that work? Well, the equator, what we would call the equator, is the, let's just call that the central position of the sun. The sun either elevates or descends and either expands or contracts over the earth to create seasons in different areas. And that's the same with the moon. The moon is moving. So the way Psalms describes it, and we'll read that at some point today, is that the sun makes its circuit over the earth. It's geocentric, and then the, the sun uh, moves around the earth. Now, NASA's cosmology is heliocentric, right? We are circling the sun. But what the scriptures teach is the sun circles us. And that's why Joshua prayed and the Lord stopped the sun because the earth was already not moving, but the sun is moving. So we already have a totally different cosmology. First chapter of the good book, totally different cosmology. God presents it to us before he presents the fact that we've sinned, before he presents the devil, and before he presents the devil, or, or the, the, the Messiah. He presents to us cosmology first, then man and sin and the devil, and then the Messiah to save us from our sins. That's the biblical narrative. And then if you go all the way to Revelation, we then have the millennial kingdom, new heaven, new earth, no more suffering. Everybody will know that it's flat finally. We don't have to argue about it anymore. So looking forward to that. But the truth is, God presents us with cosmology first, and it's a lie of the devil to just ignore it, to act like it's not important. There's a firmament. The sun was created after the earth. The sun circuits over the earth. It is geocentric. If that makes sense, say amen. All right. I know these things are new. These are new concepts. So what is the, what is the dome made of? What is this? What, what does the scripture say? Well, go to Job 37, verse 18. Look at this. Job chapter 37. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? So when discussing the firmament, this is super important, folks. In the book of Job, okay, we see, listen, we see that when God is speaking, look, verse five, God thundered marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend, okay? So our understanding of what God has created is being shown in this chapter. And it says in verse 18, hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass, which again aligns with what Ezekiel said, with what Genesis one says, that there's this solid structure and the book of Job calls it a molten glass structure. In fact, you can see through it because it is glass, but it's molten glass. It is solid. Again, why, when we created nuclear weapons, are we shooting them at the firmament? 
1962, Operation Fishbowl. Why would we do that, right? Same spirit that's always been here. Let's see if we can make war with God now, right? Let's see if our technology is great enough now. So this is believed to be made of molten glass, according to the scriptures. I just want to show you that there's a whole different cosmology. And then beneath that, go to Isaiah 40. We mentioned it a moment ago. Isaiah 40, chapter 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So we really get a real big picture, okay? Um, Look at verse 21. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? In other words, that the earth uh, is, is meant to be a firm structure, a foundation, not a moving, you know, space ball moving three different ways. But verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So then we're told that the heavens, the firmament, okay, he stretches out as a tent to dwell in. Well, a dome is like a tent. There's a tent over the circle of the earth. And Isaiah tells us. And again, Isaiah is the one. Listen, this is important. Isaiah uses the word sphere in his writings as well. Okay. I want you to understand that Isaiah says it. Look, Isaiah 22, 18. Not talking about cosmology, what does Isaiah say in 22, verse 18? He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball. Okay, completely different Hebrew word. What's the word here? Kadur, kadur, sphere, ball. That's what that word is, okay? Toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. Okay, so not talking about cosmology there. Just showing you that the Hebrew word for ball exists. Isaiah knew it. He knew the difference. And he was led by the Holy Spirit, which the scriptures say that all the prophets were carried along by the Holy Spirit when writing. He was led by the Holy Spirit to write that the earth is a circle. It is he, God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. We see this also go to Job chapter 38, verses 13 and 14. Okay. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. It is turned as clay to the seal and they stand as a garment. Now, the King James makes that a little bit harder to understand. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read to you. Let's see what the ESV. I have, I have the NIV. Um, all right. That's a little bit hard to understand. So in the NIV, we're going to read that one real quick so that you see, because I believe in this case, this one actually translates it best. Uh, Job 38, 14. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. What does that mean? Again, Isaiah says it's a circle and there's a dome over it. That's what the scriptures teach, the firmament. Job, just like he said that, that, well, just like the book of Job says that the firmament is made of molten glass, says that earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Well, if you take clay and then you have a seal, like when you're stamping an envelope and you press it down, it will create a circle with ridges and mountains and valleys and all of that. That's what it does. And so we're being told in scripture that the earth has taken shape like clay under seal. That's why there's flat areas. That's why there's mountainous regions. That's why there's deep regions with water. It's because it's like a seal pressing into clay. That's how the earth took shape. So that aligns with the circle as well. And then go to 1 Chronicles 16.30. 1 Chronicles 16.30. I know this is a lot of information. And so this probably won't be an extensive sermon because I'm dropping a lot of bombs <laughs> in one, one sermon. And so this is going to take some time to chew the cud, so to speak, to, to take some time to really understand this. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30 says, Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. And this is hardly the only scripture that says this. There are repeated passages that say the earth is fixed and immovable. It's stable. It doesn't move. 
And for some reason, as Christians, we're affirming that the earth is, yeah, it's spinning, it's orbiting, and it's vortexing through a galaxy of endless vacuous space. And yet the Bible says that it has foundations and that it's stable and it doesn't move. And we go, sorry, God, I, I don't know why you keep getting this wrong, but we're moving three different ways. <laughs> now, the sun and the moon and the stars move. I have no problem with that. The scriptures actually never say that they don't move. They say that they do move. What the scriptures say is that earth doesn't move, that the sun circuits the earth, that the earth doesn't move. That's why, have you ever seen the rock art where people will take these boulders and they'll set them on top of each other and put these tiny little rocks and they'll stack them on top of each other and they'll make these really wild geometric shapes and they don't fall over. Why? Well, because the foundation is stable. If you've got tiny little rocks holding big giant boulders and you move the foundation, it's going to flop over. And yet there they are. They just stand still. Right? So we've got magnetic north always pointing to the center of the earth. Polaris always pointing us to the center of the earth. We have observable evidence that the earth is not physically moving. Right? Airplanes, when they're flying, first off, their flight paths indicate a circular earth. If you look at the Gleason map, you'll see why flight paths are the way that they are, because that's the map that everybody uses. It's why the United Nations uses that map, because that's the actual earth. Okay, so look at the Gleason map. It's a legitimate scientific map, and that's how land masses work and their positionings. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, airplanes, really anything flying, never accounts for curvature. Never. Never. It doesn't account for curvature. Now, if you're flying at 700 miles an hour or what have you, or even faster, like Mach 2 in a jet, you know, to not account for curvature is nonsense. Mach 2 is definitely going fast enough that it would break free of whatever gravitational force was pushing down on the aircraft. Okay? What do I mean break free? I mean that it's going fast enough, and even a, a normal airliner is going fast enough that the earth would begin to curve on its own and the airplane would be higher and higher in elevation just by going straight, just by being level. The earth would be curving, what is it? Eight inches per mile squared. That is legitimate mathematics, okay? And yet, we do not design aircraft to pull down, to nose down eight inches per mile. But we'd need to if we were on a ball. We'd be in trouble. We'd be getting too high. Eventually, we'd be pointing straight up in the sky if you went far enough over that ball. So it's important to understand, folks, that that's not the way things are actually working in reality. Planes do not nose down while they fly. Geological surveys do not account. But here's the, here's the real kicker, okay? I shared this in my little uh, clip, my sermon clip that I shared on YouTube and on Instagram, which has done very well, and I really appreciate all of you who have shared it. Uh, but I, I, NASA's documentation, all their engineering documents, tons of them on NASA.gov, their PDFs, their engineering documents, always assume, listen, this is quoted, a flat, non-rotating Earth for everything. Building a helicopter, building an aircraft, building a rocket, assume a flat, non-rotating Earth. Do not add curvature or motion equations to your equations when engineering and building craft. All of them. I'm not making that up. So they know reality. Now you go, well, are they all lying? No, they're not all lying. You ever watched any sort of launch? It's a room of 100 people staring at the same screen you are. I don't believe they're all liars or they're all Masons or they're all Satanists or all part of a fraternal organization. I believe there are people who build satellites. What is a satellite? Well, the satellite is essentially a device, a computer that has radar and sensors and other things on it. I, yeah, those exist. I'm not denying their existence. But they don't go and float in the stratosphere on their own just because there's some kind of vacuum of space. When we send these things up, a few things potentially happen. We're either utilizing drones to accomplish what the satellite is supposed to accomplish. Or we're utilizing what's called ultra-thin scientific balloons that can fly for a very long time at very high altitudes. 
You were exposed to one of these balloons when China sent over a satellite attached to a balloon to the United States and it made the news and we eventually shot it down. Well, that's a satellite with sensors on it and how was it levitating? Folks, believe me, China didn't want their device to be detected by the naked human eye. They would have made it float in space if they could. But when you start to actually get into aeronautics, you realize that's not how this works. And so you attach it to what's called an ultra thin scientific balloon. Uh, the, the comical word that the flat earthers use is the satalloons. Satalloons. So you're attaching. So these are real devices. But the truth is, when it comes to data, okay, so sure, for sensors, we might need a satellite on a balloon or a drone. But when it comes to data transfer, you're being misled, okay? Our radio towers and what's called the deep sea data cables account for all data transfer that occurs. We don't need anything floating in space to transfer data. You might not even know this, and it doesn't get talked about very much, but it is legitimate, and the U.S. Navy participates in it. We lay deep sea data cables between continents, giant like structures. These are, we're not talking, it's not even like this. It's like huge. These are huge data cables that go across continents and they sit at the bottom of the ocean. And there's footage of us, you know, every once in a while we got to repair them or we got to add a new one or what have you. That is how your data is spreading across the earth. Radio towers and deep sea data cables. You do not need flying space metal for that to occur. And when you do have flying space metal, it's either drones, more recently it's drones because we have the technology for long distance, long flight with drones, or it's attached to an ultra thin scientific balloon, which is a little harder to control uh, because it's gonna be um, blown about by the wind. There's not a lot of wind higher up in the stratosphere, but it still gets blown about. Well, China sent one of those over to us. You witnessed it with your own eyes. That's actually how satellites work. No, not all employees are in on it, but there are definitely, and this is not conspiratorial, there are definitely people who serve Satan on earth and they are definitely involved at various levels of authority in science, in the arts, right? A lot of entertainers are Satanists. Uh, scientists can be Satanists. Um, you, you definitely, and, and people in government can be Satanists. And the key is that Satanists don't come out and go, hey, I'm a Satanist. They wear a suit, they trim their beard, they look nice and smart and intelligent. Satan is a serpent who appears as an angel of light, but he's deceiving you. And you've got to understand that about him. If you're receiving something, say amen. 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 So 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Shall be stable that it be not moved. Moved. So we saw in Genesis chapter 1 um, that the earth was created before the sun in Genesis chapter 1 verse 10. And the sun was set inside of the firmament, not 93 million miles away in Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 through 18. And also that it circuits. I mentioned this earlier. Let's actually read it in Psalm chapter 19 verses 4 through 6. Right. And remember, God's word is truth. You know, you're already on the wrong path when you're placing NASA above God's word. You're already on the wrong path. If you're putting any other quote unquote authority, worldly authority, government authority, whatever, professor, I don't care who it is, pastor, I don't care who it is. As soon as you place any other authority above God's word, you are going to err. So as long as you cleave to NASA instead to Christ, you will err. Okay. Psalm chapter 19 Verses four through six. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Tabernacle again is a tent. The idea of the firmament is it makes a tent over the earth. Tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Okay. His circuit, that word circuit is the key here. All right. Coming around a circuit, right? Circling the earth. Okay. So we know we're talking about the earth. We know that David has said that the sun sits inside of the tabernacle of the earth, which is again, the firmament. David definitely believes in the solid rakia, the dome over the earth. And what David is telling us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that it is the sun circuiting the earth. 
not the earth moving and circuiting the sun. What did we just read? The earth is fixed and immovable. It's not moving, right? It's stable. It doesn't move. What does move? The sun. The sun circuits the earth. This is important, okay? So the sun circuits the earth, as we see here in Psalm 19, and then it is the sun that stood still. Go to Joshua 10. We're really diving into a lot of the scriptures I mentioned in the opening statement. But Joshua chapter 10, verse 13 all right, this is during the war with the Amorites. So they prayed, right? They prayed that God would cause the sun to stop moving so they could keep fighting in daylight. Verse 13, and the sun stood still. Everybody say the sun stood still. The sun stood still. The sun stood still. Now in the NASA cosmology, you do realize that you'd need a lot of things to stand still because even if the sun stood still, the earth isn't necessarily standing still, right? So we've got three motions that have to stop for this to happen. We've got to stop the vortexing through space. We've got to stop the orbiting and we've got to stop the spinning. We've got to stop three things, right? And yet in scripture, it never says that anything else, but the sun stood still and the moon stood still. What does it say? And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? which is why we're going to read a little bit from the book of Jasher today. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. I believe it's by divine inspiration that God says, go to the book of Jasher so you can better understand cosmology here. Because the sun stands still and you go, how'd that happen? And he goes, go to the book of Jasher. Why? Well, when you look at Jasher and Enoch, you realize that they affirm strongly this terrarium idea that we see in Genesis 1 and we see in Ezekiel 1 and we see in Isaiah 40 and we see in Chronicles and we see in the Psalms and we see here in Joshua. They strongly affirm it. In fact, Jasher makes very clear during the Tower of Babel incident, which we're going to read, that they were going to reach heaven with the tower, go through the gates of heaven, okay, and make it into heaven to do battle, right? You figure... Once you've gotten through the gate of heaven, there's waters above. Well, you can float up pretty fast if you've got the right amount of oxygen and you can pull yourself up through that water and now you're into heaven ready to do battle. We don't know how deep the firmament waters are above. They may not be that deep. And so it's very possible that making war with heaven is, uh, is well, we know it's possible to do, but it's not as unachievable as our mind might think. Uh, God certainly didn't think it was unachievable. Okay, so the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? Which we're going to dive into some today. All right, so we're covering a ton of ground here. There's a ton of things that are occurring. And I want to, I want to, I want to take a break from the actual cosmology for a moment. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, okay? Because I know I've presented it, especially if this is your first time ever hearing this biblical argument, your mind could be experiencing what's called cognitive dissonance. What that means is you now have two competing ideas in your brain. It's a little bit unsettling, and now you've got to navigate through it. And I believe that the Holy Spirit can help you navigate. And here's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit will help you is by confirming that the Word is true above all other teachings. The Word is true. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, everybody say all Scripture. All Scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, everything, all scripture is by inspiration of God. The cosmological scriptures that we're reading today, do not let the devil deceive you into thinking they're unimportant. All scripture is by the inspiration of God. All scripture is supposed to be taught. All scripture is supposed to be taught. All of it matters. That's why God wrote it. God didn't tell you what detergent to use on your laundry. He did tell you that you're living under a firmament. Do you understand? If he tells you something in the Bible, it means that it matters. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. You go, I'm flattered, doctrine, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does, because all scripture is profitable for doctrine. So I rebuke and refute that statement using the scriptures. It is written that all scripture is profitable for doctrine. And then I had somebody come along and they told me, well, you know, you're not supposed to actually give 
uh, an, an interpretation or an understanding. And I thought, wow, that, that really is pretty nuts. Um, I, I've, I don't know if I've ever heard that argument. It sounded like they were really concerned. And we'll go to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. Tells us exactly what teachers of God's book are supposed to do. It says, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Okay, let's read it in a modern, um, uh, I'll read out of the ESV, verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Teachers are supposed to read from the book and then clearly make it, make it clear for you and give you understanding of what you're reading. Do you understand? It's literally our job. So I had somebody telling me, oh no, you're, you can read the scriptures like about the firmament, but you can't give like the understanding of what Rakia and firmament is. That's just obnoxious. This is the NASB 95. It says they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. So literally translating the words so that you understand their original intent in Hebrew and in Greek is actually the job of the teacher. And so again, I rebuke and refute that statement. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, about all the scriptures that we're reading. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. In other words, everything that we're reading is coming from God. Moses himself said, look, everything I wrote down in, in my five books, uh, it came from God's mouth. That's what I wrote down. It came from God's mouth. Jesus testifies to this. He says um, that Moses wrote about Jesus by the inspiration of God. Moses wrote about Jesus. The scriptures of Moses testified to Christ the Messiah. Starting at Genesis 3 and going on from there, there's tons of them. And then, of course, the other prophets prophesied this truth. So I think it's very important to understand that as we're reading about biblical cosmology, what do the scriptures teach? Well, the scriptures say that everything that we're reading is inspired by God and is for doctrine. It's for building our doctrine off of. And when we teach it, we are supposed to give the translation, the clarity, the meaning of what's being read. We are not supposed to just read it and then go, all right, and we're done, right? We're supposed to read it. And then the teachers led by the Holy Spirit are supposed to expound on it, provide exegesis. The truth is, if you support NASA's cosmology, that's eisegesis. You are reading what NASA told you into the text. Exegesis is going, look, NASA told me that vacuum and atmosphere touch each other somehow, magically. We call it gravity, uh, which is not necessary when you have buoyancy, density, and mass. And mass truly is, at the end of the day, is just weight. So they say that weight is gravity acting on mass, and so we call that weight. But the truth is, mass and weight are essentially the same thing, and there is no gravity. Anyways, so we say, oh yeah, vacuum of space touches atmosphere and it just works by magic. And that's ridiculous and unscientific. And then we read that into the text. That's eisegesis. Instead of taking what the text says, it says, hey, there's a firmament. There is a solid dome over your head that holds up the waters above. And God's throne is above that. And you're on a circle, an unmoving circle of earth. And the sun circuits you. You are geocentric. Well, that's exegesis. We are accepting what the text says and adopting it and believing it. And the truth is, there's plenty of science to back it up. The eight inches per mile squared, um, the sonoluminescence of stars, the star trails, North Star, Magnetic North. There's, there's even, there's way more than that. There are people with PhDs, engineering degrees, pilots, what have you, that have all come out and given mathematic equations and given evidences, but they're, they're censored and they're silenced. When I first started to dive into Flat Earth by the grace of God, uh, biblical cosmology is the term I prefer um, because we're not members of the Flat Earth Society. That's controlled opposition. It's nonsense. But the, um, the biblical cosmology, as I was introduced to it, um, I was introduced in 2017. And uh, that was before you pay attention to the timeline. That was before YouTube censored any of it. That was before it was censored on social media. Um, and then as it started to gain traction, uh, heavy censorship showed up. So if you search Flat Earth, on YouTube right now, unless you know exactly where you're going, like you're searching for a channel like Flat Earth Banjo or Jaronism or something like that, 
um, you can get there. But otherwise, in the search results, you're not going to pull it up. You're going to pull up all either NASA or government or, or just, you know, folks that are pro-heliocentrism, uh, pro-NASA, and their statements about it. And they'll also always show this flat, stupid-looking disk in space. And the truth is we don't believe that there's space in the first place. <laughs> we believe that there's waters above and below and we're inside of a terrarium. So that whole cosmology is just inaccurate. They started to censor. They started to obscure. These are very much the tactics of the devil. And uh, then it became very hard to find things. It's still there. It's still there. Uh, it's just very difficult with the censorship. And so I walked through this since 2017. This is not a new belief. I've even mentioned it in sermons before. This is the first time I'm preaching on its fullness. And the reason why is because I believe the Lord led me to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and really convicted me. And I want to read that with you. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. This really convicted me. Why would we talk about this? Why is this important? Well, Paul says this in Romans 1. For since the creation of the world... So he's talking about Genesis 1, right? That's the creation of the world. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. So that's the observable world. So the invisible world created the observable world, the scientific world, the natural world, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. In other words, when we stop believing what creation is, our foolish heart will be darkened and we'll have futile speculations like vacuums touching atmosphere without a solid barrier. We'll just ignore that the earth should be curving at eight inches per mile squared. We'll just ignore that water always finds its level. We'll ignore sauna luminescence. We'll ignore magnetic north. We'll ignore Polaris and the North Star. The Georgia Guidestones, before they destroyed them, had a hole that you could see the North Star every night, 365 days a year, because it doesn't move. Of course, they destroyed those Guidestones because they were too revelatory of the Church of Satan's goals, depopulation and other things. That's besides the point. I don't want to digress too much. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. When you know you're in a terrarium and a lot of atheists are coming to Christ as a result of flat earth breaking out. Why? Because when you know you're inside of a terrarium, it's a lot harder to deny God. It is. It just is. You really have to make a decision. Am I going to believe that God sent his son in the earth? to die on the cross for my sins and resurrect and then I'm going to have eternal life? Or am I going to make war with him and join Nimrod and the Antichrist and the devil himself and make war? See, the devil, and James 2 indicates this, demons believe and know that Jesus is Lord. They're at war with him. They do not obey him. So once you know you're in a terrarium and it becomes just obvious to you and it's revealed to you, you have a decision. Even as an atheist, you have a decision that the math isn't lining up, that the science isn't lining up. It looks like we're in a terrarium. The Bible says it's a terrarium. The Bible tells us about Jesus. We have a ton of extra biblical records of Jesus' life, his death, and then his supposed resurrection. The reason why I say supposed is the secular writings indicate that the Jews are saying that he resurrected, but we don't know about that. That's how the secular writings are. But they attribute, the, they, they testify to the fact that the disciples were telling people that he resurrected and nobody could find the body. That is true. And so you've got this amazing event that our calendars point to, right? <laughs> I find it interesting that we used to do B.C. and A.D., which I still do, you know, before Christ and Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. And um, I, I, I find it very interesting that we tried to switch it to common era and before common era because the question is, well, what differentiates the common from the before common era? And once again, it's the arrival of Christ. I mean, you just can't escape that the arrival of Christ is the center of the Roman, uh, Greco-Roman calendar. It just is. So God really convicted me because people come to know him through creation. Why should you be brave regarding cosmology? It is salvific. Yes, I will say it. It is salvific in nature. Why? Because Paul argues and the scriptures argue 
that knowing that there's a God and you're inside of his creation is part of you coming to know him. Hello. If that's not true, why is the devil spending seriously tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars over time on this lie specifically? On this lie specifically, why is so much money being spent? Why is there an Antarctic treaty? Our countries never get along on anything. But on Antarctica, we all get along. But what do we decide? Well, we're all going to have bases on the circle of Antarctica at different points closest to our nation. And we're not going to let people explore it without proper approval. And no one outside of the in crowd is going to receive approval. Okay? There's bizarre things occurring on earth, folks. Hidden in plain sight, as they say. Why? Because once humanity refigures out, and I believe we're in an awakening, once they refigured out that God is there and he created this terrarium for us, we're without excuse. We now got to make a decision. And I believe the devil knows that many more will come to believe in Jesus Christ when they know that they're not on some kind of spinning space rock that exploded from nothingness. And where's God? Because it's just this endless vacuum and everything's cold and dead out there. Right? No, God is on his throne in heaven above the earth, above the firmament. That is very comforting. This is why Jesus says these kinds of statements. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground outside your father's care. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid, for you are worth more than many sparrows. Why would Jesus say that to his people? Because God is not far. God is not far. His spirit is present everywhere. His physical being in the form of the Father is just above the firmament, not far. Jesus Christ came. The Word, God, in the flesh, dwelt among us. What does John 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? And then by verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he says, if you've, seen the, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Why do you keep asking, show us the Father? We see the Father in Christ. In other words, the Father wants us to know him. Sent Jesus to die on the cross. God in the form of the Son died on the cross perfectly, sinlessly, as the Lamb of God on the cross for your sins. And resurrected three days later. And the resurrection is its own discussion. There's a lot of evidence of the resurrection. That's its own sermon. The Roman guard, the women at the tomb. There's so many things surrounding that. The eyewitnesses during that first century. You only need two or three in a court of law. And yet we have over 500 in that first century. It's wild. Paul's conversion. He's, he, he ends up, he has a great life. Persecuting Christians, admired papers from you know, the high priest, Roman citizen. Then he has like a terrible life serving the Lord, telling people that Jesus resurrected. What do I mean by terrible? I mean, in the natural realm, terrible. He's getting shipwrecked. He's getting beaten. He's getting stoned. He ends up beheaded in Rome. I mean, it, it, his life doesn't make sense. None of their lives make sense if they are living for a lie. And so there's so much. Chuck Colson has a really good talk about why Watergate proves that the resurrection is true. I encourage you to listen to it if you've never heard it. He was part of Watergate, by the way, so he should know. And he shared why the resurrection was true. Good man would go into prisons uh, before he passed away and just minister the gospel to people. It's a good man. Um, so that they are without excuse. So once you get to this point where you realize that this is the way the world works and the earth was created this way, it points you to the fact that God exists. When you know God exists, you can hear the gospel and believe it more e easily. There's still the devil that we're fighting but you can believe it more easily and come to know him. And there's been a lot of atheists. In fact, hopefully they'll comment on this sermon, but I've seen them in a lot of flat earth videos. Said, look, I was an atheist or I wasn't a believer. I was agnostic or what have you. And it started with flat earth and I came to Christ. So for all the naysayers who are saying, oh, it's not important. There's just too many people who have converted and believed in Jesus Christ as a result of hearing what proper cosmology. Why? Because I believe all truth leads to Jesus. Jesus said what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I believe all truth leads to Jesus. Cosmological truth 
leads to Jesus. You know, how? Well, because if you're in a creation made by a creator, that creator is Jesus. <laughs> in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word made flesh. The creator is Jesus. So when you get to know creation, you know there's a creator and the creator is Christ. Right? Yes. Are there other religions and stuff you've got to wrestle through? Yeah, but what you'll find is this is the only one, the only one where your personal effort is not what's going to save you. Right? Islam, you've got to do enough good. If you don't do enough good, you could do some jihad, kill some people, and then you'll get into heaven. Even in um, Judaism, right? It's all about the 613 laws of the Torah. You've got to do these. That's how you're going to get in. If you don't do these enough, you're not going to get in. Right? Personal effort. Buddhism, steal your effort. Right? There's proverbial laws and rules in that. Meditation, all the other things. Right? Hinduism, pick a god. Right? That's essentially what that is. Make up a god. Just pick one and make a, you know. That's Hinduism. But in all of them, you have some kind of effort you have to do. In Christianity, it's unique. It stands apart from the rest. Christ did it for you. He did the work you couldn't do. You couldn't live a sinless life. You couldn't die on the cross for your sins and be forgiven as a result of it. You couldn't resurrect from the dead. All of that is Christ's work on your behalf. That's the grace of God rendered unto you. And that is why we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, not of works so that no man can boast. Now, we do good works. What did Timothy say? What did Paul say to Timothy? Well, good doctrine is it's going to result so that you're thoroughly equipped for good works. Why? Because, well, as a Christian, we're not going to go around murdering people or being greedy or lying to people about cosmology. We're going to tell people the truth. We're going to be generous. We're going to forgive people when they wrong us. We're going to turn the other cheek. We're going to live a different way. We're going to practice good works. But we're not doing good works to be saved. That's every other religion. Our good works are because we're saved, right? Let your light so shine that they may see your good works, works and glorify your Father in heaven. We want to point people to Jesus through our good works. Not, we're not trying to get saved through our good works, okay? We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. That is how you're saved. You believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and resurrected three days later. Romans 10 says it this way, that you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's what the scriptures teach. So what's the point of talking about biblical cosmology? To point you to Christ. It's a means to an end. It's not the, it's not the end all be all. It's Genesis 1. But what matters is Genesis 2, we started sinning. Right? Well, Genesis 2 is also mankind. And, but Genesis 3, we started sinning. Serpents deceiving us, NASAing us, right? And now we need to believe in the one who came to crush the serpent's head. If you're receiving something, say amen. 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 Come on, folks. This is, this is good stuff. This is Holy Spirit inspired. This is, this is what the Lord wants more preachers. I know some preachers listen to me. The Lord wants you to be courageous and to read this and to teach this to people. Okay. So I want to read to you the Tower of Babel story. We read Genesis 11. I would like to read Jasher to you as we start to wind this down. I want to read the book of Jasher. I want to introduce you to the book of Jasher. Um, and I'm going to read it directly from my notes here because uh, it's not going to be inside of the Bible app because it's considered extra biblical, even though the Bible says we should be reading it. Okay, Jasher, chapter 9, verses 20 through 39. Now, to give a little uh, understanding of Jasher, Jasher is from Genesis to Joshua. That's what it covers. And it adds additional details to the stories that we read. So you get more detail. Like, for example, we're going to read the Tower of Babel. You get a lot more detail regarding the Tower of Babel in Jasher than in the Genesis account. Why? Because I believe in the Genesis account and in the biblical narrative as we know, 66 books, which I don't like that number. That kind of indicates to me that we might be missing some books. But uh, what, what the scriptures indicate to me is they are sufficient for salvation in Christ. So there's enough about everything from Genesis to Revelation to believe in Jesus Christ. Certainly. Absolutely. However, that doesn't mean that everything we're reading is for sure the totality of scripture. And the fact that the scriptures indicate and quote from Enoch and Jasher, I think is a really strong argument for those books. Now, I know the Catholics have additional books, but I actually agree with the Protestants that those books um, are additions, like Bell and the Dragon and, 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 and uh, Maccabees. and these. They, they sometimes are recording history, but they're not necessarily scripture because they're not cited throughout the scriptures. They're not quoted throughout the scriptures, whereas Enoch and Jasher are cited and quoted in the scriptures. Okay? <laughs> So let's read this. Jasher, Jasher chapter 9, verses 20 through 39. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. 
And let's dive into it together. And King Nimrod reigned securely and all the earth was under his control and all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. So clearly we're aligning with the Genesis account. Okay. But it adds more detail. Verse 21. And all the princes of Nimrod and his great men took counsel together. Uh, Fut, Mitzrayim, or yeah, Mitzrayim, Cush, and Canaan and their families. And they said to each other, come, let us build ourselves a city and in it a strong tower and its top reaching heaven. And we will make ourselves famed so that we may reign upon the whole world in order that the evil of our enemies may cease from us, that we may reign mightily over them and that we may not become scattered over the earth on account of their wars. What does that mean? And that's essentially what the Genesis account says. What does that mean? It means that, hey, if we build a tower all the way to heaven, all of mankind will fear us instead of God. So we can go and overthrow God and we'll be the top dogs. Well, this is exactly Satan's goal. When we read the narrative of Satan in Ezekiel, it says that in his heart, he said, I will ascend, I will become like the Most High God. Well, Nimrod is being just like that. He's, I will ascend and I will become like the Most High God. Right? Verse 22. And they all went before the king and they took the king, told the king these words and the king agreed with them in this affair and he did so. So Nimrod took this idea, ran with it. Verse 23. And all the families assembled, consisting of about 600,000 men, and they went to seek an extensive piece of ground to build the city and the tower. And they sought in the whole earth and they found none like one valley at the east of the land of Shinar, about two days walk. And they journeyed there and they dwelt there. Okay, so they had to find a large plot of land that was wide enough for this tower. Scriptures are going to indicate how wide the base was as we continue on. Verse 24. And they began to make bricks and burn fires to build the city and the tower that they had imagined to complete. And the building of the tower was unto them a transgression and a sin. And they began to build it. And whilst they were building against the Lord God of heaven, they imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. There it is, folks. It's implied in the Genesis story. It's explicitly stated in Jasher. Hence why even the book of Joshua says, hey, go read this story in the book of Joshua. Verse 26. And all these people and all the families divided themselves in three parts. The first said, we will ascend into heaven and fight against him. The second said, we will ascend to heaven and place our own gods there and serve them. And the third part said, we will ascend to heaven and smite him with bows and spears. And God knew all their works and all their evil thoughts. And he saw the city and the tower which they were building. Satan's church here on earth has not stopped this goal. I just want you to understand. They're deceiving you, but they have every intent to kill God. That's their like primary goal. They still want to do it. They want to break through that firmament. They want to make war with God. This is nothing new. This is an ancient problem. This is mankind. When he's not serving God, he's against God. He joins the devil. Verse 27. And when they were building, they built themselves a great city and a very high strong tower. And on account of its height, the mortar and bricks did not reach the builders in their ascent to it until those who went up had completed a full year. And after that, they reached to the builders and gave them the mortar and the bricks. Thus was it done daily. Do you understand what was just said there? It says when it was reaching the height that God got involved, it would take a one year journey to the top of this tower. <laughs> a one year journey. To the, you see why they don't want you to read Jasher? Because when you read it, you're like, okay, well, this, this does not agree with current cosmology. And it's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's the point. You've been lied to. This is actually the truth. This story took a year to get to the top. Verse 28. And behold, these ascended and others descended the whole day. And if a brick should fall from their hands and get broken, they would all weep over it. And if a man fell and died, none of them would look at him. In other words, these are godless men. They don't have a love of neighbor. They just want to kill God. The brick falls, right? This is, a, this is an example of man being consumed with materialism instead of spiritual things. What did Jesus say? The flesh counts for nothing. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. These people are all about the flesh. They're buildings. They want to destroy God. They're in the flesh. They're very earthly minded. They don't even, they don't even cry over their brethren when they fall and die during this project. They're like, eh. It's the cost of killing God. You know, it's just this evil attitude. Okay. Verse 29. And the Lord knew their thoughts. And it came to pass when they were building, they cast the arrows towards the heavens 
And all the arrows fell upon them filled with blood. And when they saw them, they said to each other, Surely we have slain all those that are in heaven. So they shot arrows up towards the firmament, and the arrows fell down with blood on them. Okay? Which was symbolic of, you know, oh, we're, we, we think we're actually slaying the angels up there. We're winning. Right? It's a little, little trickery. Okay. <laughs> Verse 31. And they built the tower in the city, and they did this thing daily until many days and years were elapsed. And God said to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him, to those who are near to him, saying, Come, let us descend and confuse their tongues, that one man shall not understand the language of his neighbor. And they did so unto them. And from that day following, they forgot each man his neighbor's tongue, and they could not understand to speak in one tongue. And when the builder took from the hands of his neighbor lime or stone, which he did not order, the builder would cast it away, throw it upon his neighbor, that he would die. So still, they got their language confused, and they're still not loving neighbor. They're literally killing each other. Verse 34, And they did so many days, and they killed many of them in this manner. Verse 35, And the Lord smote the three divisions that were there, and he punished them according to their works and designs. Those who said, We will ascend to heaven and serve our gods, became like apes and elephants, and those who said, we will smite the heaven with, with arrows, the Lord killed them, one man through the hand of his neighbor. And the third division of those who said, we will ascend to heaven and fight against him, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. Okay, so the first group became like apes and elephants. That actually is very similar to what happened in Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember in the story of Nebuchadnezzar. So he did that to that group. The next group, he, ha he killed those people the ones who were literally shooting arrows uh, up towards the firmament, he killed those people by having them kill each other. So he had them enter into a chaotic state. This happens in other wars in the Bible. And then that last group, he scattered them across the earth, which means that all people groups have a little bit of this descendancy in them. Okay. Verse 36, And those who were left amongst them, when they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building, and they also became scattered upon the face of the whole earth. Verse 37. And they ceased building the city and the tower. Therefore, he called that place Babel. For there the Lord confounded the language of the whole earth. Behold, it was at the east of the land of Shinar. God actually did a great job here. I genuinely believe that. Because confusing our language really slowed down the whole war against God thing. And that was excellent. Excellent idea, Lord. Verse 38. And as to the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one third part thereof. Pay attention to this part. This is wild. So we know it was so tall, at least at this point, that it took one year to ascend, okay, to the top of it, to bring bricks and mortar to the top. Uh, and there was constantly men doing that, going up and down. Um, but look at this. Look at how big it was at its base, right? And as the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one third part. Okay, so one third falls into the earth, or is, in other words, like collapses because the earth opens up, a sinkhole, Right? And a fire also descended from heaven and burned another third. So another third of it gets destroyed in a very similar fashion to Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire from heaven comes and starts to melt that mortar and cause it to come apart and, and break apart and fall. And the other third left to this day, okay, so at the writing of Jasher, left to this day, and it is of that part which was aloft, and its <laughs> circumference is three days walk. One third of this tower, according to scripture, took three days to walk around the circumference of what was left of the rubble took three days, meaning it was even wider. So when you think about the height of the firmament, right, we know that amateur balloons showing a flat horizon have reached like 120,000 plus uh, miles. Eventually, the firmament's up there. Operation Fishbowl tested that. We know it's up there. Okay. Okay. Um, these guys had a base, a tower, so wide that the one-third left took three days to circle around it. And at its height, the highest point it reached, it never made it to the gate of heaven, but at its highest point, it took one year to ascend the tower. This was a tremendous monolithic structure. We've never seen anything like it. No building in Dubai or New York City. No pyramid in Egypt. Nothing has ever been like this structure. It really was unique. And so there's nothing new under the sun. So I'm presenting you, in the purpose of this sermon, I'm presenting you with this question. 
Was that tower being built into the vacuum of space where they all would suffocate? And if so, why did God intervene and confuse the language? They were all just going to die when they reached space. Or is biblical cosmology true? Was oxygen higher in the atmosphere because of larger trees and a different climate at the time? Were they building a tower that literally it would take one year to ascend at its height? It was going to go even further. And were they going to break through the firmament and make war with God? Well, I'm presenting to you that both in Jasher and in Genesis, it indicates that God says that nothing that they've desired to do will be impossible for them. And so he intervened, confusing the language and destroying the tower. Is this a fable or is it fact? Is this poetic or is it a fact of history? Is it an event that took place? I believe that the fact that we have modern Babylonians in the time of Israel points to the fact that everybody knew where Babel was. Even in this early post-flood, this is, right at, this is not long after the flood. In this early post-flood world, you have the original Babylon, and then you have during Israel's time, and even today we know where it is, you have Babylon. Why would the ancient peoples call it Babylon? They knew where this tower was. This occurred, just like the flood occurred. And we literally have Babylonians all the way up, I mean literally thousands of years later, fighting with the Israelites, taking them captive. In fact, that's very illustrative of our current condition. Babylon is tricking us and taking us captive with cosmology, with the truth about Jesus Christ and the resurrection. You are in a war. Even the scriptures indicate this. They say that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of darkness. Folks, you have to be prayed up. You have to worship. You need to read the word. You need to speak the truth to your neighbors. You need to be doing good works and loving thy neighbor. What did the people here in Babel do? They killed each other. They didn't care about each other. You're on the path of Babel if you don't care about people. You've got to start caring. What's Matthew 25 say? In the separation of the sheep and the goats, verses 31 through 46, Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. Right? This, this, this is what Jesus says. And he says, whatever you've done in the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you've done unto me. And some people try to say, well, that's just for Christians. Well, no. Jesus said he's the son of man. He came for both Jew and Gentile. He identifies as human when he says son of man, just like he identifies divine when he says son of God. So he says, whatever you do for your neighbors, you do for me. What's the royal law? The whole reason. If you believe you're in a terrarium, what's the point of believing it? It's not just to go, ah, the government lies. It's, it's not just for that. It should inspire you to serve Jesus Christ, the Lord of this terrarium that we're in. This realm, as Tesla would say. Jesus calls it the kingdom of heaven, and he says it's in your midst. We're supposed to go about loving our neighbors, not just trying to make them feel stupid or arguing about the shape of the earth, but literally loving them, caring about them. Yes, we tell them the truth because we love them, but we also do good works because we love them. We forgive them because we love them. Folks, we're in a war. We're in Babylon. Revelation says that there's a mystery Babylon. I have every reason to believe that's the Western world. Why? Well, to break it down simply, in Daniel, you have a statue starting with the head of Babylon, right? That golden head. And then you have Medo-Persia, uh, which is the uh, breastplate. And then you have the loins, which is uh, Greece. And then from the loins come the two legs of iron, which is Rome. And Rome splits in two. And then Rome becomes the feet of iron and clay with ten toes. And those are the tribes that descended out from Rome. Three of them actually fall, just like Daniel's prophecy says. The rest become the modern Western world. Babylon's only a mystery for the rest of the Western world. But if you're biblical, you can know you are in mystery Babylon if you're in the Western world. We're sort of strong, sort of weak, sort of biblical, sort of not. That's that iron and clay. And so you can escape mystery Babylon by loving thy neighbor and living in God's kingdom, by making Jesus your Lord and Savior, by making him king over you. That's the whole point of cosmology. 
Yes, the firmament is presented first in Genesis 1. I affirm that. I believe it's salvific that we should talk about it. But the whole point of it is to show you that you're in God's terrarium and you need God to save you from this serpent in the garden. And he sent Jesus Christ to save you. We believe that as Christians. Amen? amen. If you've been receiving something, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to wrap up. I appreciate you guys. I know this has been a lot of information. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. We're going to start to wrap this up. I want you to see that this is nothing new. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19 says this, And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. In other words, we've been commanded, mankind has been commanded over and over, not just here in Deuteronomy 4, to not be drawn away to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. And that's what this is. NASA and worldly cosmology, it, it, it's a religion. How can you say that? Every planet, quote unquote, which there's no such thing, they're just wandering stars, according to scripture. But every planet is named after a pagan god. They put pagan gods outside of their scientific facilities. There is nothing new under the sun. There are pagan, satanic star worshipers deceiving you, making you think you're made of stardust when you're actually made in the image of God. Don't align yourself with them. They are liars. Why would Satan lie about creation? We're going to wrap it up. Why would they lie? I've heard that question a lot of times. Why would they lie? Why would they lie? Because it's the first topic of Scripture. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first thing they're trying to hide because it's the first verse of the first chapter of the first book. And so Satan is committed to obscuring that truth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Has our belief in planets not caused mankind to wander from the knowledge of God's existence and be deceived? Interestingly enough, in Greek, the, the Greek root for planets is a wandering star and it also figuratively means someone who leads others astray. Has our belief in planets not caused mankind to wander from the knowledge of God's existence and be deceived? Have we not named all the planets after pagan gods? Why are we spending $22.6 billion annually, $62 million a day on NASA while poverty is ravaging the lives of so many? If you didn't know that, NASA spends $62 Two million tax dollars a day. That's $22.6 billion. Where's the money going? It's not going to space. There is no space. Where's it going? Our very first red flag should be that we're using terms given us by secular science, not by scripture. Even if we are undecided on a topic or this one, we would be wise to no longer use terminology the scriptures never use. Likewise, when people ask about creation, we would also be wise not to respond, NASA says, but rather, it is written. Why? Because God's word matters. When speaking of the earth, the Bible never uses the word planet for earth. It simply says earth in Genesis 1.1. never says planetary solar system. It says wandering stars in Jude chapter 1, verse 13. It never uses the word orbit. Instead, it says the earth is fixed and immovable in 1 Chronicles 16.30. It never says space. It says heavens. Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. Covered by a firmament in Genesis 1, 6. Made of molten glass in Job 37, 18. It never says globe. It says circle in Isaiah 40, verse 22. It never says gravity. It says in him all things hold together in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. The Greek word planeo used in scripture means to cause to wander. That's the root of planet. The Greek word planetes, another root, is used in scripture. It means a wanderer, a false teacher operating without moral compass and exploiting other aimless people. I want you to realize that the NASA deception is there in Genesis 3 and it's been going on for thousands of years. It's nothing new. And I pray that the Lord will grant you understanding and that you will be able to see that this is true. Let me ask you this question as a closing question. How is everybody going to view Jesus simultaneously when he returns? According to Matthew 24, 27, everybody will see it. Verses 29 through 30, everyone will witness these things. Well, how? Well, the sun is darkened, the moon's darkened, the stars don't give light. 
no matter where you are on the earth, if you see him directly above or because of perspective, you will see a bright light at the edge of the earth if you're in the southern hemisphere towards the center. And if you're towards the northern hemisphere towards the center, you will see him because he will be descending on Jerusalem, a bright light, him and the angels, and all the believers will get caught up with him, it says in scripture. How does that occur on a globular earth? There's going to be a bunch of people on one side who physically could not see Jesus returning. And yet the scriptures indicate the whole world will see him simultaneously at the return. So I'll leave you with this. Thank you for sticking with me. Have you learned something today? If you have, say amen. amen. Go to Luke 24, 45. Luke 24, verse 45. Look at verse 44. He said to them, this is Jesus, right? He's appeared to his disciples. And he says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That's my prayer for you. As we wrap this up for today, I pray that the Lord will open your mind so you can understand the scriptures. Your mind has been closed by the deceiver and he's deceived you into even doubting your own eyes. Folks, they're using fisheye lenses when they show you a curved earth. That's why you have amateur balloon footage at over 120,000 feet and the horizontal line of the horizon is still evident when you don't have a fisheye lens, but then you have people taking selfies at the top of Everest showing a curve on earth, which is way lower and, and, and they're saying, look, the earth is curved. You can see it from the top of Everest. No, it's literally a fisheye lens. Stop being deceived. The Holy Spirit, the Lord himself, will open your mind so you can understand the scriptures. Humbly ask him to do so. Humbly ask him, Lord, if I'm wrong about the shape of the earth, please reveal it to me. Have that kind of attitude instead of a NASA, thus saith the NASA astronaut. You know, why are all the astronauts masons? Why are they parts of fraternal organizations? Why will you never be an astronaut? Because you're not part of those organizations. Don't believe them. Believe the word. And when you believe the word humbly, God will open your mind to understand the scriptures. And that's my prayer for you, that he will open your mind to understand the scriptures regarding biblical cosmology, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the millennial kingdom because he is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Did you receive something today? Praise the Lord. Glad you guys are here. Those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. We pray that the Lord blesses you and keeps you, that he makes his face to shine upon you, and is gracious to you, that he lifts up his countenance to you and gives you peace. If you would like to support this ministry, we really appreciate it. First, you can like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, ask questions below. We'd love to engage with you. Let's be respectful in the comments. And also, if you'd like to give and support this ministry, we're not a giant ministry, but we do have a church and we also have homes for children who are aging out of foster care. So your gifts help to support my family, the Legacy family, LegacyHousingProject.org. You can learn more about that. And also our church, which we're a small, humble little church. If you'd like to support us, you can give by texting the word GIVE to 386-753-7337. And your gifts really make a difference. And we're really grateful for all of you who have signed up for monthly regular monthly giving that really helps us to understand our budget so that we can uh, continue to expand the ministry and reach more people and improve even our media presence online. And we're just very grateful for your support. Even the scriptures indicate that as we share spiritual goods with you, this is what Paul said, you ought to share material goods with us. And so we're very grateful for your material support as we spiritually support you. We love you guys. We thank you. Thanks for sticking through this entire sermon. I hope it's given you some things to consider. And I pray that the Lord blesses you. We love you guys. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.